So good to see you this morning. I was watching the news the other day and somebody said on the news that only in Idaho can you get all four seasons in 24 hours. <laughs> Amen. Wasn't that beautiful this morning? I had to laugh as we drove in because so many of the trees are in full bloom. They're just gorgeous with flowers on them and it's snowing. So, but that's Idaho, isn't it? Glad you're here this morning. Thank you for attending. If you're a visitor this morning, we want you to know that you're special to us. We want you to know uh, that we care about you and that uh, we love having visitors and may God bless you. And if you're watching us online, thank you for joining us. Well, last week we started to look at the habits of a, uh, of a good heart and um, how the heart influences our lives. So just to warm you up a little bit, let me ask you kind of a silly question, okay? It's one that doesn't require an answer because it's just one of those types of questions. Have you all ever had to eat crow? Now, you younger folks may not know what that is, and you may have to ask to find somebody there to find out what that is. But how do you like it? Do you like it barbecued or maybe on the rotisserie or fried? Or is it better if you eat the uh, feathers and all? Is that the way you eat it? I tell you, when you have to eat crow, it's pretty humiliating, isn't it? Well, our goal this morning is to do everything possible with a good heart to avoid that crow diet. We're going to take crow out of the diet altogether, and hopefully we can do that. We sing a song sometimes, and it's an old song. All of self and none of thee. Some of self and some of thee. And then less of self and more of thee. And then finally, none of self and all of thee. Now, every one of us in this room fit into that song someplace. Have you ever thought where maybe you fit into that song? I know because you're here this morning, I know where you want to be, and that's where I want to be as well. But I got to tell you, I, I kind of struggle with that. I hover somewhere between some of self and less of self. I have trouble moving into that uh, upward swing that I need to get into where I'm closer. And I know what the problem is. It's a real simple one. It's self, isn't it? Self just always, always gets in the way and makes it so difficult. And so it's obvious that we need God's help to move forward. Well, we're not advancing, so maybe we can see what's going on there. It's my magic touch. I had this last week, too, so just bear with me. So. Yep, I got, it's a flashing four, and, you know, let me push it one more time and see what happens. It goes to five, which I don't want five. I want two. Well, while they're working on that, let's continue a little bit. Backwards. Backwards. Okay. Well, we just have such frill. There we go. It's going to be one of those mornings. Folks, let's just go home. <laughs> uh, well, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at um, considering ways that uh, we can move our heart just a little bit closer to the Lord and get close, closer to him. And so if we can, over the next few weeks, if we can just move that needle just a little bit in the right direction, just a tab, we're going to be successful. So let me share with you this morning, it's still not advancing, okay, they'll work on, there we go, that's where we want to be. Anyway, I want to share with you an ancient fable, all right? This is a very short one, um, I really enjoyed it, and maybe you all have heard it. It's uh, very lighthearted, but it has a great, great meaning, I think. It's an ancient fable of a frog and a goose who became good friends. They sang duets together and helped each other find food. In general, they respected each other's gifts. Uh, they were just best buds. Then the fall of the year came, and it was time for the goose to fly south for the winter. The goose said he would like to take the frog with him, but he didn't know how they could do it. The frog suggested that he tie a string around the goose and then hold the other end with his mouth. 
That's just what they did. And it worked fine as they flew high through the sky until a farmer saw the strange sight and shouted out, What a marvelous plan! Who thought of it? And bursting with pride, the frog could not resist shouting back, I did! <laughs> well, it kind of reminds me of that uh, It goes something like, Take heed when you think you fly, lest you fall. Or it's, That's kind of close, isn't it? You all know which passage that is? <laughs> so you all tell me, what is the point of that parable? Or that fable, excuse me. What's the point of it? Any thoughts? Pride comes before the fall. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Shelby, so listen. Can, you, can you try and see if it will flip? It will not. So, um, and I'm on four on this thing. I want to go to three. Uh, can you guys do it manually back there? I can raise my hand or something. Well, it says the battery is, it shows where the battery is. It's almost dead. It's almost dead. Kind of like the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move along a little bit. I'm going to share with the passage and uh, let's see. This is where we want to be right now in this passage. <clears throat> in the same way, younger people should be willing to be under older people. And all of you should be very humble with, uh, with each other. God is against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Be humble under the, God's powerful hand so that he will lift you up when the time is right. I would like to share with you this morning an experience that Mary and I had, not in this congregation, in a different congregation before we came here. And it was kind of a, a well, it's, it's just a good example of humility. We were having a gospel meeting where we were attending, and we'd invited this uh, speaker to come in. And, oh, he was um, just so talented and such a wonderful job he did and uh, just a loving guy. Do you think we're live? Thank you, sir. Mary and I had him into our home for a meal, and he had his wife with him. As soon as they walked in the front door, we could tell. These were special people. Oh, they were. They were so warm. They were so friendly. They were so gracious, so loving and kind, and they made you feel like, well, you've known them just about all your life. After the meal, we went into the living room, and we have a piano in there, and his wife, the preacher's wife, got up and went to the piano and started playing the piano, and we all got up and stood around the piano, and we sang songs and laughed together and had the greatest time this was just an incredibly humble people. I want to tell you that's how humble people are a blessing in our lives. And maybe that's why the Lord wants you and I to be humble. So let's talk about humility for just a few minutes. As I looked at this particular question I'm going to ask you, um, I struggled with it quite a bit. I did a lot of, did some research, some studying, some thinking and pondering, which is strange for me and just to try to figure out what it was. But here's my question for you. I would welcome your insight. Is, hum is humility and meekness the same thing? Or let me word it a little differently. Is there a difference between being humble and being meek? And if so, what is it? You all give me some insights into that. Anybody care to take a run at that? And... Okay, we're gonna move on. And I'll tell you what, uh, well, there's Larry over there. He is going to give us some words of wisdom. I can tell by that smile on his face. Here you have gone and got everybody's hopes up, Shelby. <laughs> to me, they're very much the same. Okay, very well said. I tell you, that, that is, that, here's Darla's got a, wait, 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 Mike's coming. We want to be able to, uh, the folks online that they can hear you and... Okay. Now I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Um, I, I think a slight difference is a person can be humble but not be meek. They can be a great orator. They can, you know, not, they can be outgoing. Yep. Yet realize their place in humanity and, you know, Whereas a meek person just seems like they're kind of withdrawn and, yeah. you know, maybe I've got the wrong idea about meek, but I don't see them as being outgoing. And yeah. 
That's a good insight, good insight. We get in for the last little bit more. I want to talk about that just a little bit. Dick has a comment here. I see him somewhat like Darla says, but I don't see somebody, I see somebody being very gracious and humble, but they can still be strong in what they're, in their convictions. And, and you know, it, it takes strength sometimes to speak out against somebody. Sure. And I think a person can still be humble and gracious at the same time. Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about that. Larry's uh, over here. I'm uh, Richard, right over Richard Sutton. Well, in Matthew 11 chapter, you know, <clears throat> Jesus is spoken of as being meek and humble in heart. Yes. So there's obviously a difference there. The meekness, I think, is the idea idea of which is the most common definition is. is power that's under control yes and so he's the son of God he had all kinds of power that he could do and yet he didn't take advantage of people from that and if you think of Philippians the second chapter well, although he existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped he's meek so he's got this power but he doesn't abuse that power he's humble in that he knows who he is yes and so he doesn't have to throw himself out as uh, the super person he knows that he's the son of God he knows he has the power, but he's humble in the way he handles that, that power. Yes, very well said. I, uh, you know, I, as I looked at this and the more and more I considered it and thought about it, I come up with the idea that, that humility and meekness are like twins, but not identical twins. As I studied it, I, I almost thought that meekness was more well, what we might consider a fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5 lists a couple things in there that sure talk about this idea of meekness. That they are gentle, gentleness, and self-control. And that makes up the very DNA of meekness. The Lord said it so well that the meek would be blessed and that it's such a great quality to have. Well, moving on, I think one of the things that we can see very clearly about a humble person is that they have a very modest, modest spirit. A humble person has freedom from being pretentious, from being conceited, from being haughty, from being self-glorious. He is not puffed up. He's not full of himself. If he's full of himself, it's hard for God to fill anything in his life, isn't it? He's not egotistical. He's not an arrogant person. We don't find any of these qualities at all in a person that's humble. And that's the kind of people that God wants each one of us to be. And may God bless us this morning, each one of us, with a humble heart. Wendell has a comment. When you look at the definition in Merriam-Webster about meek, I just find it very informative. It's enduring injury with patience and without resentment. And that's a challenge either way. It is. Uh, because we want to react and we don't want to wait. And we, and we don't want to keep the resentment out of it, you know. So yes. it's a nice challenge. Yes, absolutely is a challenge for us. To be a humble person, family, is not about showing how spiritual we are but it's about showing how much we depend upon God in our lives. Absolutely necessary. So we can see that being humbleness uh, pleases the Lord. So let's look at some ways, possible ways that maybe will help us be humble. First of all, be quiet about yourself. Well, it just went blank on me. I don't know. I mean, uh, and it... Okay. Okay, we're good. This is the passage I was looking for. Jeremiah. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. Be quiet about yourself. Always talking about yourself, I tell you, family, is overrated. I'm under the opinion that anybody that spends all their time talking about themselves, the only ears they're probably going to impress is their own. It gets old and it gets old in a hurry, doesn't it? A humble person is not boastful. 
And if we tend to be a little boastful, we need to get that out of our diet. We need to become a humble people. So that's one of the areas that will help us be humble is not spend all of our time talking about ourselves. Second, we need to be quiet about our actions. Matthew, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and pray so people will see them. I tell you the truth, they already have their full reward. When our granddaughter was about two years old, one of our granddaughters, now this isn't Keisha, so don't go harassing Keisha. When one of our granddaughters was about two years old, she was probably pretty typical, but boy, she really wanted attention. In fact, she demanded attention. I think her most popular words, or her, her vocabulary consisted of, look at me or watch me. Now, if you all got a little kid in your family, you've probably experienced some of this. <laughs> anytime that you would look away, she'd remind me, Papa, look at me. Or anytime you maybe have a conversation with somebody else, you'd say, Papa, Papa, watch me, watch me. Now, I tell you, when you're two years old, that is precious, and that is about as cute as it gets, isn't it? But when you're an adult, yeah, not so much, is it? <laughs> if your goal in life is to have people watch you, then put on a show, and you're going to get your reward as shallow as it is. But if your goal in life is to be blessed by God, you've got to put on a humble heart. Another way to help us to be humble is to never, ever think of ourselves as better as somebody else or to look down on other people. Went blank again, so I don't know what... Uh, Okay, so it looks like maybe. Okay, thank you. Let's read this passage. Luke. Jesus told this story to some people who thought they were very good and looked down on everybody else. A Pharisee and a tax collector both went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood alone and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people who steal, cheat, or take part in adultery, or even like this, this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give one-tenth of everything I get. The tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even look up to heaven, but he beat on his chest because he was so sad. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, when this man went home, he was right with God, but the Pharisee was not. All who make themselves great will be made humble, but all who make themselves humble will be made great. I don't know if you noticed or not, but this short little portion of the prayer of the Pharisee here, and knowing the Pharisee, that was just a small portion of his prayer. But five times he used the pronoun I. Do you think maybe he might have been a little full of himself? He could not stop tooting his own horn. The other thing I noticed about him, and I thought about it, that he was a bit judgmental, wasn't he? He said, boy, I am thankful. I'm not like that low down, rotten, good for nothing tax collector. He was judgmental. But something that I noticed that caught my eye is not what he said, but what he didn't say. Nowhere in his prayer did he ask God for forgiveness. I don't know. Maybe he thought that his righteousness was good enough to warrant or to merit God's favor. I don't know. But what a contrast we see. The tax collector humbles himself, confesses his sin, and begs God for forgiveness. A lot of takeaways from this. But the one that we want to focus on today is that we never look down on other people and never consider ourselves better than them. The humble heart is blessed by God. So far, we've looked at a couple ways to, to help us have that humble heart. Just don't spend all of our time talking about ourselves and don't be looking down on other people. But let me suggest one more way. Encourage others to be all they can be in the Lord. Philippians, when you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than to yourself. Do not be interested in the only in your own life, 
but be interested in the lives of others. Humility will always drive us to put others before ourselves. And I, I got to tell you, family, that's not an easy task, is it? Because we fight, we all fight that same battle, and that same battle is us, me, inside, self. And it's going to take God's help for us to get over that. At times, it may require us to step down and allow somebody else to use their talents. We don't have to always think, I'm the only one that can do this, or I can do this better than somebody else. Step down and let somebody else use their talents. It will be good. It will be healthy. That's humility. Encouraging others to do, to be everything that they can for the Lord is good for the body. It's a blessing for all of us. You have greater influence for the Lord, and the world is a better place because of it. Here's the big three no-nos that I have listed about humility. Okay, ready for these. Number one, don't be a conversation hog. Okay, dial it back. Sometimes a good listener is a lot more effective than a talker. When Mary and I were first married, uh, one of the first jobs I had was in Portland. And my boss, well, his name was Woody. Woody was the most precious guy. I mean, uh, we, we loved Woody. Him and his wife were so kind to us. Uh, we were just married. You know, I was just a kid, you know, didn't know which way is up. But he kind of took us under his wing and a great guy. But I got to tell you, Woody was a talker. Now, listen, I'm not saying a talker. He, he was a talker. You know what I mean? This guy was it. When he got started on something, you better bring your lunch. I, I found out that about the only way that I could ever get a word in edgewise is I just let him run down until he ran out of air. When he stopped to grab a, a little air, I could squeeze something in. That was just it. Always talking, always talking. We need to invite people into our conversations. We need to let them talk. It's good. That's what we need to do. Don't be a conversation hog. Number two, don't be a show hog. Okay, share the floor. Share the, share the spotlight. Don't try to top their stories. Don't, it's not about you. Encourage others to be involved in it. Number three, don't be a boss hog, okay? Don't be too pushy. Don't always nag them to death. Give them room to breathe and give them some time. The last thing you want is when they see you coming, they think, oh, no, there, that person comes again. They're always biting on my heel, just nagging me to death. Uh, where do I run? Sometimes if you are too pushy, too much of a boss hog, you drive people away from where they need to be. And that's a warning for us not to be that. Remember, humility delights when others shine. And to be humble, we've got to be very, very focused. John, I am the vine and you are the branches. If any remain in me and I remain in them, produce much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. I think the takeaway on this passage is, the real heart of it is, that without the Lord, if we don't have the Lord in our faith walk, we're not going to be very successful. And when we finally fully realize that, the importance of the Lord in our lives, the total dependency that we have on Lord, it will humble us. And family, when we're humbled, then God can use us in big ways. Well, let's take a look at some of the, uh, some feedback or get some feedback from you all, okay? So let me ask this question. What quality in a person makes you realize that they are humble? Um, there's probably a lot in there. I'll shoot one up here just to kind of get us going a little bit. A humble person makes you feel valued. To be devalued by somebody is painful, hurtful. We need to be valued. And a humble person has that ability to make us feel valued. A humble person will make you feel loved. Now, God just kind of made us this way, don't we? We all need somebody to love us. And a humble person has that way to know when you are talking with them that they love you and that they care about you. That is such a wonderful thing about a humble person. A humble person will listen to you and consider your thoughts. Now, this is important. 
Have you ever gone to somebody, maybe a concern or something that's kind of bugging you a little bit and you chatted with them and they just blew you off? Just blew you off. Said, oh, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. Talk to you later. Nobody likes to be blown off. If it's important to them, you need to step back a little bit and consider what it is and help them as much as you can. A humble person cares about what you think. Kind of the same thought, isn't it? A humble person will be a comfort in, t- in time of need. Now listen, family, not everybody knows that you might be in need. If you're in need, listen, you've got to be humble enough to ask for help. That's a hard thing for us sometimes. You've got to be humble enough to ask for help. And when you need help, look for somebody that's humble. They're going to be the ones that will probably be able to help you the very best. This is a great thing, great thing for us. And finally, a humble person will make you feel respected. It is important that we feel respected and not disrespected. A humble person has that ability. So one of the qualities that our elders have is that they are not filled with pride. And if they're not filled with pride, then they have to have a humble heart. And that quality isn't just limited to our elders. In fact, that quality is something that God demands each and every one of us. Whether we're young or old or female, male, whatever we are, whatever our status is in life, that's what we have. We've got to have a humble heart. And to have a humble heart is a choice, isn't it? Listen, family, we can either make that choice to have a humble heart and we bring glory to God now, or we can wait and let the Lord humble us. And I tell you, it's going to be ugly. It's not going to be good. Jesus provides a beautiful picture of a humble heart. Mark. Not so with you. Instead, when you want to become great, um, those that want to become great among you must be your servant. And those who want, whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus shows in this passage what greatness is all about. Greatness is not about I'm the boss and you all are the little people. And you little people out there just do what you're told. I'll do the thinking and you just do. Okay? That's not what it's about. It's the exact opposite of that, isn't it? The, in, in the world, the big boss always just, he's after one thing, more and more. He wants more from you, more and anywhere he can get it. But Jesus, our Lord, he didn't want more. He wanted to give all that he had. And when pride fills our heart, humility is choked out. In our next passage, Jesus is going to drive this home. Mark, for, ev- for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus expressed his humility every day that he walked on the earth. Look at how he lived. He served the poorest and the lowliest of mankind. He was there for them. He gave of his precious time, and his time was very precious because he had a very short stay here on this earth. He cared for the sick and the poor, the outcast, the forgotten, the undesirables. He cared about them. He owned nothing, but really he had it all, didn't he? But Jesus was homeless. He had very little quiet time or very little privacy to himself, but that was okay because he was a servant and he had this incredible humble heart and he practiced self-denial, which is required of us if we're going to be humble. That was the life of our Lord every day. But let's also take a look at how he was treated. He suffered threats. He suffered abuse. Mean and angry words, very hurtful to him. Even the religious leaders of the day, they wanted to nail him to the cross. They wanted to kill Jesus. But you know what? He loved them anyway. He loved them anyway. He wanted them to turn from that way of living and thinking and turn to God. Turn to God and God's will and to obey it and to be saved. What an incredible Savior, isn't it? 
to be treated that way and yet to have this humble spirit about him. And through all this, all that he went through, every day he was journeying towards the cross and family he knew where he was going. And being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself he became, by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is a big one. Getting your arms and your, your mind around this passage is, is a big one. Let me read it one more time. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. The very creator, the creator that created everything, the one that made the world we live in, the beautiful mountains and the seas and the oceans and the deserts and the rainforest, everything we sense, everything that is around about us. And he, he put breath into mankind and driven by love, Jesus the creator humbles himself in the creation to those that were created. That's humility. And it's really a very, very high standard. God wants us to work at being humble every day because he wants to bless us. And if you have a humble spirit, God will bless you. And he's going to bless those around you. And you'll be more of an effective tool for the Lord. It's what you need to have as a humble heart. We've got a marshal over here. Comment. That um, term humble is generally used, it's a military term, generally used in that sense. So if we look at what he did right here, it almost seems contradictory, the ability. If we have an ability, then we need to be willing to do like what he did, submit ourselves to other to use that ability. It doesn't mean that we can't um, stand up and say, hey, well, I can do this. Um, the point is, I can do that, now how can I help you with it? So this whole idea of him being humbled to really understand what he did it's, and understand what that word term means, that was really impactful. Yes. The reason he was a servant, because he was the only one that could get that done. Yes, absolutely. We've got a comment from Larry. I think woven throughout the biblical idea of humility and even the biblical approach to meekness is a willingness to take risk, a willingness to be rejected, uh, a willingness to be uh, abused, take risk to be abused. Uh, if we can't take risk, we really can't be humble. Great thought, great thought. That is very, very good. To be a humble heart or to have a humble heart is really part of God's plan. In Numbers, number 12, God talks about Moses. He has this to say about Moses. God calls Moses more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Moses at that time was the most humble man walking on the earth. Now, I want you to keep that at the very top of your mind. So we'll talk a little bit more about Moses here, but this is an important thought. I love what one author had to say about Moses, that he spent the first 40 of his years, 40 years of his life, thinking he was a somebody. He spent the second 40 years of his life learning that he was a nobody. And he spent the last 40 years of his life discovering what God can do with a nobody. Oh, that's so good. But I want you to watch now that the death of Moses... Here's what the scriptures had to say, Deuteronomy. There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord knew Moses face to face and sent him to do signs and miracles in Egypt to the king, to all the officers, and to the whole land of Egypt. Moses had great power, and he did great and wonderful things for all of Israel to see. Richard kind of touched on this, and, 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 and to me, being humble means that you've got to know who you are, but more importantly, you've got to know who God is, and Moses was a master at this. We've got to take a look at this final example, John 13. 
I was almost, it was almost time for the Passover feast. Jesus knew that it was time for him to leave the world and go back to the Father. He had always loved those who were his own in the world, and he loved them all the way to the end. Jesus and his followers were at the evening meal. The devil had already persuaded Judas uh, to turn against Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him power over everything and that he had come from God and was going back to God. On his waist, then he poured water into a bowl and began to wash the followers' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. We can almost see this setting, can't we? Jesus taking that basin or that bowl and kneeling down in front of one of his disciples and washing their feet and drying it. And then he goes all the way around that table, one by one, washing their feet. The setting of this was that Judas was just right at the point of betraying Jesus. Strange that none of the disciples there, none of those sitting at that table, volunteered to do this task. Because the task of washing other people's feet was for the servant. Not any servant, but the very lowest, the, the bottom of the heap, bottom of the totem pole. It was reserved for that person. But our Lord humbles himself, takes that towel, walks around, and washes the apostles' feet because he loved them so much. And in a few hours, Jesus would humble himself and submit to the cross. That's humility. Here's our thought for today. The more humble we are, the more God can use us. A humble heart is a healthy heart, isn't it? Family, we need to each one of us work on it. I need to work on it, I know I do. It's not an easy project, it's not an easy thing. We've gotta get that self under control. It's a struggle, I know it is for me, and probably some of you, but it's something we gotta work at because God will bless us if we do, and it will be a very rich blessing. Well, let's see how much time we got here. Got just uh, maybe about uh, five minutes. Maybe I'll just start by asking you a, a real quick question, okay, before we close out. What kind of comment makes others feel I used to worship in Las Lunas, New Mexico, and when I first got there, almost every Sunday, there was something that the, the preacher did wrong. He would have a scripture wrong or words wrong or something, and I'd come up after church and, and tell him about it. And finally, he criticized me. And from that day on, I didn't. And he taught me a lesson. Yes, sometimes uh, those lessons are kind of hard, aren't they? Kind of hard. We need to be encouragers. We, we need to encourage people and uh, not nitpick about them, that's for sure. Any other comments? Any other thoughts about that question? Nolan. I think, I think the Lord's brother, James, also makes a statement here that helps us all, especially me, along this humility path. In chapter 1 and verse 19, James says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. <laughs> I think that's good advice. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. Our mouth gets us in trouble in a big hurry, doesn't it? Generally, the first to speak is a loser, I tell you. That's just the way it kind of works out for you. Let me ask you another. This is a goofy question. Filling out resumes, have any of you ever put on your resume that you were a humble person? Well, that's kind of a double whammy, I suppose. I mean, if you're tooting your horn about you're a humble person, I mean, that doesn't work too well. But let me, let me ask you, why would you not put on your resume that you're a humble person? Why wouldn't you put it there? Do you, do you, yeah. <laughs> it's a lie and you'll never get hired. Yeah. 
Well, I tell you, the world isn't looking for humility, isn't it? Oh, they want submission. They, they want you to just do what you're told and, and uh, stay out of trouble. But they're not looking for a humble person. That's not what they're looking for. But I tell you, that's what they're looking for in the church. That's what God wants. Let me ask you this uh, final question. Is it always obvious when somebody has a humble heart? I asked that question because I was thinking about Moses. Do you believe that Pharaoh thought that Moses was a humble person? <laughs> Not always obvious, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to have a wrap here pretty soon. Does anybody have any comments, any thoughts? Next week, we're going to be uh, treated to Steve. Steve Zeller is going to give up, come up and give us a, a lesson, and I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be good. I thank you so much for being here. You're such a blessing in my life. I love you, and you always put joy in my heart to be humble. Thank you.